is the Memphis Milwaukee Show. It's 7 o'clock on Sunday, and it's time for Free Thought Radio Milwaukee's Mythicist Milwaukee Show with our guest tonight. We are extremely excited to welcome Dia Murdoch to the show, Acharya S. Are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank you. We've got a little bit of a technical hang-up here, and we are uh, live at uh, Mythicist Milwaukee Show. This is riverwestradio.com, and we are extremely proud to talk to DM Murdoch tonight. Do we call you DM? Do we call you Acharya S? What do you like to be called? <laughs> Everything but what, whatever first name people think I go by. <laughs> I, I hate that when people go to Wikipedia or someplace and think they know what my first name is. It drives me crazy. They can guess who that Well, I'm really not interested. I just want to uh, know what to, what to call you <laughs> as we speak I tonight. Care. If it I makes you know. more comfortable to, to say DM, then that's fine. Beautiful. Our uh, fanboys, Sean and uh, Antonio, have written a, a beautiful intro, so let me get through this here, and then we will uh, get on sure. with a couple of questions for you. Uh, you are an independent scholar of comparative religion and mythology, and feel free to correct me anytime on any of these points. Classically educated, receiving a degree in classics, Greek civilization from Franklin and Marshall, Dia Murdoch is also a member of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, Greece, one of the world's most exclusive institutes for the study of ancient Greek civilization. She has served as trench master on archaeological excavations in Corinth, Greece, and Connecticut, USA, as well as a teacher's assistant on the Isle of Crete. She's a polyglot. This, uh, this, this uh, excites me, you guys. This part's my favorite part. Who speaks, reads, and or writes English, Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, German, Portuguese, just to name a few. I hope <laughs> Klingon's in there somewhere. Man. That's awesome. She's the author of oh, several yeah, books. <laughs> That's just a few of them. That's fantastic. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, she's the author of several books, including The Christ Conspiracy, great title, and Christ in Egypt, Egypt, the Horus Jesus Connection, among many, many others. She is a proponent and leading scholar of the Christ myth theory. Her latest book, Did Moses, Moses Exist?, provides a massive amount of information from antiquity about the world's religious traditions and mythology, including how solar myths, wine cultivation, and fertility cults have shaped the Bible and Judaism. The book is also respected, is already respected as the most comprehensive study to date on the subject of Moses. We're extremely proud to welcome the champion of the mythicist cause, D.M. Murdoch, and I have to say that it's very poetic that we speak on the solstice. Happy solstice to you. Just leave it or you'll break it. Yes, happy solstice to you, too, in uh, multiple languages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that word I wouldn't know in very many languages, but I think it's uh, worked out. I don't know. Did you guys plan that this way? Yes. Uh, yes that's awesome uh, to have you on on the solstice. We're all fanboys here. Uh, Sean and Antonio, of course, this specifically turned me on. To mythicism, uh, and your resume is obviously a lot more than mythicism, and we could talk probably all day, you and I, about Portuguese or one of the other uh, fun things, uh, but I do want to ask, we're going to go try to keep it to a few topics, because I know you're a, you're a fount of knowledge, and we're going to act like these guys really kind of know your stuff, I know it a little bit uh, through them, and we're going to try to keep this to some nuggets for the layperson who uh, most of our listeners are, are probably pretty new to the topic. So I want you to tell me about Connecticut. First of all, I'm from Connecticut. Where did you and what did you ex excavate in Connecticut? Oh, I don't usually tell people that I'm from Connecticut as well, but that's where my family has been since the 17th century. You misunderstand me. I, I just asked about the excavation, the trench master <laughs> stuff. I didn't mean to I expose that. the... <laughs> I know that, oh, but cool. I, okay. um, I decided to just go with the flow. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, like... My family landed in Massachusetts in 1630, so we've been in that territory for a long time. I like Ten it. years behind the pilgrims. Yes, they were in response to the pilgrims who sent back to England for proselytizers to convert the savages. Very nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think so we found like our first nugget. Yeah, I like to say that I've come to undo their karma. <laughs> And irony, we like it. An original, an, an original uh, wasp. I love it. Uh, oh yeah, uh, definitely a wasp. Blue, blue blood, traceable all the way back to King Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, and even 
with, through Eleanor of Aquitaine all the way to the ninth century in France, I've traced our family tree. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Do you? So, but that means that they've been Christian since at least that time. My <laughs> my family genetics. Right there, you go. Well, t- tell me about the excavation there, though. What did what did yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Uh, now I'm getting feedback on my cruddy phone, but so I don't know if everybody else is hearing. No, you're echo. real clean here. It sounds great if you can hear us. Okay, that's great. I can deal with hearing myself repeated in my ear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I excavated under the auspices of Dr. Kenneth Fader, who is a leading skeptical archaeologist who goes on TV. You've seen him with big white hair. He likes to, they use him as counterpoint on the shows about ancient aliens and giants and things like that. So he's a skeptical archaeologist. And uh, he's cited my work. But we just excavated a 3,000-year-old Native American tool-making camp, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, I imagine so. I didn't know if maybe there's just Connecticut's famous for some dinosaur fossils and, uh, and famous also. No, we didn't find anything spectacular, but it was neat. It was on a river bank and just reminded us that there were lots of humans occupying these fertile regions long before my proselytizing ancestors <laughs> arrived in the 17th century. And yeah, not, and not a, a lick of Christianity there either. <laughs> Unfortunately, there were no real artifacts that I could cite that would uphold the mythicist perspective. Now, do you wish uh, your your the whole uh, your whole image is new to me, and what I know of it uh, did not include this? Uh, and so, I was uh, interested to know that you you have archaeological experience in that yeah. way. Do you wish uh, your image were more uh, of that of a scientist? Or are you aware of your public image? What do you think about that? Uh, I think my image is just fine. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm coming at this like an innocent. I don't. So I, I wonder if, uh, if. Well, I also studied arch- in Greece and spent about two years total there, and traveled all over the country. Was one of the best institutes for the study of Greek civilization. Uh, and I'm a alumna of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, Greece, and went to about 200 different archaeological sites during that period of <clears throat> that, and uh, that was postgraduate work, but I also did, I was also there for college for a uh, half a year, a semester. Wow, and I'm turning it, green over here. That that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was great. You know, that was like decades ago, because I'm, I'm one of the the elders now, but so don't mess with me. But, <laughs> <laughs> that's the one badge we get as we get older. We like, you know, you know, be quiet, <laughs> pipe down there, youngsters. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. But I did while I was there, I excavated at Corinth, where Saint Paul supposedly addressed the Corinthians, mm-hmm. and that was a very pivotal site. And also used to get to go on the Parthenon in Athens because our school was allowed to actually climb up on it. That was after they'd closed it already. But I went there also when I was 14, and that really ignited everything for me because I I said, this is what I want to study. This is where I would really love to have lived in Greece and Athens. And I started learning the language a little bit then, but then when I went to university, I studied... Greek, ancient Greek, and when I eventually went to Greece during college, I spoke Greek. I, I taught myself, and uh, no, I mean, I'd learned ancient Greek, but I taught myself modern Greek. So that gave me the qualifications to read the Old Testament, or rather the um, the New Testament and the Septuagint, or the Greek Old Testament, in the original language of Greek, and that's been extremely helpful to uh, my studies, and also encourage, you know, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with myself after after college, because everyone told me, your liberal arts education is worthless. <laughs> 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 Why didn't you get an MBA? They told me the same thing. I didn't listen. I actually have fights with people over that, <laughs> trying to convince me how they would be making millions of dollars, and I would be working in the the 
secretary pool, which sort of is what happened, but uh, that's all right. We like you better as an author than a middle manager. <laughs> did, did, did this archaeology interest morph into the mythicism, or how did that happen? Well, I started archaeology, and I started Greek civilization, but... I had been raised a mild Christian in the protestant sect, and so I'm, I'm always protesting. But I, was, I released myself from that, what I, even though it was a really nice, friendly denomination, congregationalist, very mild, no hellfire mm-hmm. and brimstone. I decided when I was about seven that I would uh, make up my mind to get out of it by when I was 12, and that's pretty much what... All my siblings did. We just were like, okay, that's enough of that. Just sort of quit going to to church, which we found to be dreadfully boring. <laughs> that's a lot of wherewithal <sighs> for a 12-year-old. That's awesome. We have a- oh, yeah. Oh, I was bored at 7. I was like, oh, please release me from this oppression. <laughs> but, you know, like, I, I, I never put down the minister or any of the congregationalists or the fellow members because they were all very nice, and it was a lovely community, and everybody was upright and good people. They would look out for each other. So that's that wasn't the point. It was just I didn't want to sit there and listen to some boring, boring sermons about tent pegs in, you know, in in ancient times, like the straight out of Monty Python routine. It was just like. <laughs> <laughs> I was a congregationalist. I'm so charmed that uh, I've met another one. We're kind of a oh, yeah. kind of well, kind of fading away, isn't it? Sounds like well. Yeah. Yeah, the more mild forms of Christianity are dying. Is that what it looks like? Yes, yeah, so that is what it looks like, yeah. yeah. My mother eventually became a Unitarian. She went from Baptist to Congregationalist to Unitarian, so it was really moving away from the fundies. Yeah, see, she stuff. went the right way. Now, my mom went from, you know, Congregationalist to Assembly of God to Freak, something like that. Oh, dear. <laughs> went the other way. But I guess what we're getting at is what what, what really made you dedicate your life to the to, to proving the mythological origins. It seems so important, and all of a sudden there's a movement yeah. afoot, and you are, uh, for better or worse, I, with, with the most visible face, or one of the most visible faces of the mythicist movement. Why is it so important? Um, well, here, here's how it goes. So I'm, so I'm in this place, and I was kind of like not really practicing or anything, but I didn't make any decision that I didn't like Christianity necessarily. But then I went to Greece and I I just when we got involved in the Greek Orthodox studies I, it was very depressing and dreary and the ancient Greek pre-Christian religion and mythology were just much more fascinating and had this intense vibe if you went to if you ever gone to these sites like in Corinth and Delphi and Olympia and Athens it's just like I, I was always very excited, but then I would go into a medieval Christian church and just be like, I was so <laughs> It was just a terrible sensation, the difference between life and death, really. There were images of martyrs being fl- flayed and boiled, and it was just awful, you know, <laughs> the Christian period. And so I had this fondness that had gone back to childhood for Greek myths, and then actually being in the place where they were where they they were uh created just ex- was very exciting uh, so that whole background then when i eventually I, I after college i became a born again temporarily and it was a very uncomfortable experience and uh then i decided to really study all manner of religions across the spectrum and in that quest I came across a book called Forgery in Christianity by Joseph Wheelis who was a lawyer in the 30s very astute individual he used the Catholic Encyclopedia to convict itself and demonstrate that a massive amount of early Christian literature had been forged in the name of various individuals and he right then and there stated that Christ was a mythical figure, not a historical person. And that kind of just, my eyeballs just like jumped out of my head. And I started looking at the evidence for what we call the mythicist case, mythicist perspective, mythicism. And the first place you start is 
with the supposed historical evidence for a Jesus of Nazareth, and then you discover that there is none that is really credible and that is that holds up to scientific scrutiny. Uh, and so I uncovered this information, and I started really getting into it, studying it, and discovered that there was this massive body of literature associated with this mythicism. And it covered all these different elements. People raised up the various proofs like Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny. That's the first step. That's a really the basic that a lot of other mythicists get stuck in this place of trying to disprove a historical Jesus when that's like kindergarten. And they need to move beyond that. And this is when they come to me, because once you've already established that Josephus is useless, Tacitus is useless, Suetonius is useless, and also realizing that the burden of proof is not on us to disprove a historical character. We're not, we cannot prove Jesus never existed. We hear all the time, you cannot prove a negative. And there's people who argue with that concept. But in order to avoid it, because I don't want to get into some long back and forth, I just say we don't need to prove that a Jesus didn't exist because there were Jesuses in antiquity, but it's not their story in the New Testament. What we can say is the gospel story is myth-historicized and Judaized, not history either literally or mythologized. And we can prove that case sufficiently, in my opinion, by presenting the pre-Christian mythology and religion upon which it, the story was drawn. So that's where it stands for me, and why I was compelled after having that realization, and also knowing my background and my skills that I would have to talk about this, bring forth the research, teach this information. Now, is there, you and I, uh, I don't know if you, if you realize it was me on Twitter the other day. You're pretty active on Twitter, it seems. And we got into Sometimes. a thread. I, I hooked you guys up on a thread with, an, with, with some goof from South Africa, I think, because he, he had asked me uh, questions that were over my head, and I simply referred, to him, for, referred him to Mythicist Milwaukee and to you. And uh, he, he, uh, he, he got it in his head that I, you know, I think I said that you know, the historians that have looked into this typically are coming at it with a bias because they're mostly, mostly Christian or Judeo-Christian historians. And they kind of have an axe to grind or a dog in the fight. Uh, uh, and, and he right away snapped back that, uh, you know, that was silly, that there are plenty of objective historians that, that think Jesus was, was real. Is, am I wrong? Is this not obvious? What, what you, the evidence that you guys have uncovered, is it not, like you say, kindergarten? So is it not obvious? Is it not beyond even uh, speculating on? Or is there really some credible historians who are objective who think that Jesus existed? Well, that's like the no true Scotsman fallacy, because we could be like them. They like to say that no credible historian believes Jesus didn't exist. So they made that the bar. If you don't believe it, you're not a credible historian. We could make it the other way and say no credible historian believes that Jesus did exist. <laughs> and then you just get into a, a battle there, but... Here's what I would say. The vast majority, majority of historians, no matter how good or bad they are at their feet in their field, have not studied this large body of Jesus mythicist literature that I keep referring to. They do not know the arguments dissecting and analyzing the various proofs proffered by apologists, Josephus, Testus, Tonius, Pliny, and the others, Thallus, Phlegon, Marbar, Serapion. They don't know that these 
supposed sources have been dissected thoroughly in the original languages, word for word, and shown not to be what they appear to be when they've been translated and regurgitated to the masses. So they're, they're not, although they can look at and say, oh, well, I've been raised all my life to believe that there's a, there was a historical Jesus, they have not looked at that data, and they are not then experts on those particular specialized elements of this perspective or case that we're making. Right, which you should be. It almost, like to me, that that's the football coach knows his own team but also knows his opponents. Have, how can you really argue for something when you don't know the counter arguments? Yeah, and they, but they'll admit, like, my uh, nemesis of his own making, Bart Ehrman, that they never even heard of this before. What the heck is this mythicism thing? Well, it didn't even cross my mind. But then they pretend after just hearing it go in one ear and out the other that they're experts at the subject. What, it takes years to study this. Even if you were just to start with Josephus studies, it would take you a significant amount of time to get through all the literature, not just analyzing it, what part of the testimony in Flavianum might be genuine, but the arguments against it in depth. Who, who's they the date testimony? Back centuries. What I can you back up a second? Uh, the what the testimony of? Testimony in Flavianum is the passage in Josephus that people like to hold up and say, "Well, there it proves there was a historical Jesus." That passage has been dissected to death, and it was so thoroughly analyzed that in the, in past centuries that it was a done deal for some decades. People completely omitted it when they offered proofs for a historical Christianity, or historical Jesus. They, it had been so thoroughly demolished as evidence oh, in because toto. It, was it clearly written later? Is that the idea? Or Yeah, it's an interpolation. I have no doubt about that. There's multiple reasons for it. If you look at the, the Greek, too, of the language that's being used and how it breaks the narrative, you can see that it had been inserted in, wedged in, using language a century later. It would be sort of like writing as we do now and trying to interpolate something into a Charles Dickens book. Mm -hmm. it, kind of, it stands out. If you know the language you're looking at, so like, well, it looks a little odd. It's even out of context in the conversation, isn't it? It doesn't even it flow. Is. It is. <laughs> wedged like right in there. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it would be a marginal note that crept in, or it could have been deliberately inserted, because I have also little doubt that there were people in antiquity who were saying, hey, wait a second, <laughs> there's no historical record, even back then, of course. There, there were skeptics and critics. We know some of their arguments because they were preserved in the polemics by their Christian detractors. But the fact that a lot of these writings of Christian, Christianity's critics were destroyed should also be an indication of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I mean, and historians don't factor that in either. They don't think about why were all these critics of Christianity, why were their writings destroyed? Why were they suppressed? Why were they not preserved? Something's fishy going on there. What about the forger himself? Was that Eusebius or, I mean, have you figured that out? Well, it's hard to tell because not only am I resisted at every turn by religious fanatics, but my fellow skeptics are quite difficult to approach in large part, and they've been uh, let's say contentious, to say the least. But if I had a team of open-minded, skeptical scholars on mul in multiple fields, disciplines, and at possibly hidden archives in, say, the Vatican, hmm. I think we could get we could find some things that would be in this quest. But there's too many biases and 
you know, all this bigotry and pushback and closed. Everybody's all closed up, and they don't, they wouldn't go for that. And then it's you know, expensive and so forth. So that's a difficult quest. But on the face of it, there are some good arguments that Eusebius had a hand in the testimony in Flavianum, which only really shows up clearly when he starts talking about it. And this word tribe that appears in there is one of his little buzzwords. And so that in itself is a little curious because it's uh, it's not a commonly used term by Josephus or I think it's a little anachronistic even for the time when Josephus was writing. Interesting. So, so speaking yeah, of other reasons for that. Other forgeries and additives, like in the in the Gospels, I mean, I think you, you get at why Jesus is a myth. I, I think it was prophesied that he'd be born in Bethlehem, and they had to create a narrative, I think it's in Matthew, to, to get him there from Nazareth. And I'm wondering, is Nazareth even a town? What's going right. on there? Can you, can you speak to that? Yes, I wrote a paper called Was There Historical Jesus of Nazareth? The Use of Midrash to Create a Fictional Detail in the New Testament or in the gospel tale, gospel story. That element seems to have been included to incorporate the sect of Nazarenes rather than representing an actual town. The evidence we have is that this was not really any place anybody would be coming from or living in. Looks like there may have been an Acropolis there at the time when Christ supposedly existed. And my analysis is that, and for the most part, where English uh, translations render this phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, it's actually Jesus the Nazarene. And so then when we start looking at, well, what is a Nazarene? He's, in the Old Testament, you have, uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Elijah? Samson. Okay. Yeah, Samson is the Nazarene. And mm. then you start thinking, well, he didn't come from Nazareth. So the Nazarene is a sect, and then there's Nazarean, and there are different elements of it. And it's, this, is quite an, this was a, uh, object of great fascination, a subject of great fascination for the early church fathers to discuss these different sects. But the sect of the Nazarenes would have been incorporated for a particular reason. And interestingly enough, they had a carpenter motif. They're a carpenter guild. And so now we discover why he becomes a carpenter. And it appears that he was the the carpenter, the god. And so the carpenter and the Nazarene, this was a very big sect that had to be incorporated into the myth, into the story for some reason. Possibly because you're talking about a really old guild or sect. Uh, they may have had a lot of money. So the most wealthy mm -hmm. sects would have been given priority in incorporating into the story. And along with the Nazarenes and the carpenters would also be the wine merchants. And as we know, there's a heavy focus on wine in yeah. the New Testament. Wasn't that one of the bigger industries in the Roman Empire and in that ancient world? Enormous. And my book, Did Moses Exist, goes into great detail about that. It's absolutely fascinating. The biases that prevent people from studying this material are a pity because when you look at it, you go, wow, it all starts to make sense. This is a big deal. This is very exciting. Uh, the wine industry was enormous, and with it became this well-developed cult that the god eventually became called Dionysus, obviously, we know that. But before that, even for centuries, you're talking 14th century BCE, back uh, possibly to 7,000 years ago, maybe more, there was wine being made either from cultivated grapes or earlier from wild grapes. And it's pretty well... It's pretty good guess that even in the very remote ages there would be a god associated with that or a goddess. Yeah, and what a better what a better way to um, keep your client base than to make it part of the religion, right? It seems like sales one on one to me. 
But were no, no. previous yeah, people ahead. doing this too, or like that? It didn't. This isn't unique to Christianity, but that wine is in in wine consuming is is part of other religions that precede it, too, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes, this is what you find when you start digging in the Moses myth, for example. Very, very many characteristics in common with Dionysus, mm. and we find that wine was very central. They both prohibited it and created it as and used it as a sacrament <laughs> in the Semitic religions. Uh, there's a story in the Ugaritic texts from Canaan. These are very fundamental texts for the study of the Bible because they predate the Hebrew, and you can find many of the tales in the Old Testament in the Ugaritic texts. Which is a very important city reaching its peak around 1200, 1300 B.C., and they discuss similar wine parties with massive amounts of wine and huge sacred chalices, holy grail type concepts. And at that and time, then, they, they yeah. were under control of the Egyptians, I think, around that time. There were Egyptians in the Levant dating back to maybe 6,000 years ago, mm. having a cultural exchange with the people who eventually be call, were called the Phoenicians. Okay. And these people had been trading their massive cedars to the Egyptians who were using that wood to build fabulous temples as well as boats that uh, went along the Nile and other rivers, but they did not, they were not really seagoing. The Egyptians weren't. Right. But the Phoenicians were, right? I think their, their major city oh, was yeah. Tyre. They later founded Carthage. Um, but so there's a lot of interaction is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. This cultural exchange has been going on for thousands of years. That's one thing people don't really understand. They think this is all isolated, people mm -hmm. popping up, and but this has been going on. And so much so that Egyptian and Canaanite mythology became intertwined, and some of the language went back and forth. And there were gods, Egyptian gods, in worshipped in Canaan, and there were Canaanite deities worshipped by the Egyptians. Can you tell us about some of those? Well, I can remember Hathor, the Egyptian goddess Hathor, was the mistress of Byblos, and, and Isis, of course, was a... a an alter ego of hers, and that's why you have this story of Isis and Osiris, and Isis goes to Byblos and encases or finds his body parts in wood there. So you've got that wooden connection, and they're also saying that Osiris, who's a foliage god, is part of this great uh, Lebanese cedar wood carpentry cult. And so, but then you have the god Seth, or Set, who has a very strong Levantine tinge to him, even though he's Egyptian, and various groups of Semitic wanderers, or Bedouin, had uh, as their main god Seth, or Set, those would be the Hyksos, who took over the Delta region during the second millennium mm -hmm. and sort of somewhat ruled Egypt, ruled that part of Egypt. And what all of this demonstrates is that there was a tremendous flow of culture back and forth, but explicitly from Egypt into the Levant. And so when we talk about biblical mythology or religion, we have to realize that there's absolutely no way that it was not influenced by Egypt. It, it certainly was influenced by Egypt. I demonstrate quite a lot of that in the Moses book. And But this filtration continues throughout the, sec, the first millennium. And you have at this point, then you also have the Greeks coming into that region. And they start influencing all of the religion around the Mediterranean, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. And what you then end up with, after these various forces, bringing the Romans and the Etruscans, 
and then there's some Indian input coming as well from mm -hmm. the east. Uh, that's percolating and eventually creating Christianity. And you can see how all of those factors are just thrown into the stew uh, that becomes this universal religion, which is the meaning of the word Catholic. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly see that in the traditions. But like rewinding a little bit, pre-Christianity, what, what, what about the, the Exodus? Why create this epic saga story, which there really isn't any evidence for? Like, what, why, why would you create that? Is, is there a motive? Well, yeah, that's a, a typical tribal thing to do. They're obviously trying to blow themselves up well beyond what they really were, which is quite classic. You have the Greeks telling their stories of Olympus and imbuing great importance to their own culture okay. that way, saying, look, the, the gods are favoring us. We are the product of the gods. We are the chosen people. That you find everywhere, but... So, like, I went to high school with Bono, so therefore I'm cool? <laughs> Guilt by association. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the Exodus, as I sh and I show all this in my book, Did Moses Exist? You can actually see, you can trace how it was developed. The Exodus story starts out with a typical battle between the god and the sea monster, uh, sometimes also a sea god, like Poseidon. Mm -hmm. And the sky god is fighting <clears throat> this monster. And in this regard, in the Bible itself, Pharaoh is called the dragon. And so this is where eager texts come in handy again, because you have the story of Baal versus Yom, and the word Yom means sea. And so then we have Yahweh versus Yom, Suf, which is the Red Sea. Hmm. And that core mythos, which was very popular around the Eastern Mediterranean, for good reason, because the sea was absolutely terrifying to people. It brought them great abundance of food, but, it, but traveling on it was frightening. And if you had the misfortune of sinking, you're going to just go down into these black depths which were monstrous, and your cold, lifeless body. And at, mm -hmm. these people were great believers in afterlife, but to have the, your body sinking to the bottom of this abyss was terrifying uh, for not just your death, but your afterlife as well. So these stories were extremely important, fighting the sea. And sea vessels at the time could only hang out by the coast, right? You couldn't sail across the Red Sea, that technology probably wasn't there, is that right? Uh, there were some shallow places, and people definitely crossed them. And I, I'm, I'm not sure that they couldn't with boats, I'm, you know, walking across. But I do believe that in our thousands of years of exodus out of Africa, that people did cross at different points of the Red Sea. But, and that's, that's an important factor, too, to note that in our current DNA studies, the reigning theory is that most people came from Africa mm -hmm. and crossed through that region into the rest of the world. And that means thousands of exoduses over a period of thousands of years. There were people coming and going and coming and going. And this is why possibly it was located in that region, the, the story of the Exodus. But we also find in the tale of Dionysus, him fleeing into the Ruddy Sea, mm -hmm. the Red Sea, uh, which would be an Osirian myth. Dionysus is closely intertwined with Osiris in Egypt. No, so the story itself not, isn't always original. That's no. You get, you get this core myth from the, Levant, from the Levant, which is where Israel and Jordan, Syria, these, that region is, the, the, the Semitic Babylon and so forth, this, well, especially towards the sea, uh, the sea monster battle. You have this core myth, and then you have all these additions to it over a period of centuries. And they added not only Dionysian elements, but also from the Epic of Gilgamesh, 
which is another analysis I go into in my book, Did Moses Exist?, about Gilgamesh, the word, even the word mesh, and Moshe, which is the Semitic for, or the Hebrew for Moses. Wow. They, yeah, they took elements from the Gilgamesh epic and mm. added that to the Moses story. And I've got several points in my book about that. Quite fascinating. That's incredible. This, so Moses yeah, Gilgamesh, is definitely a myth and not a real character. Right. He's a compilation of different myths that had been floating around, and somebody gathered them, several people, whatever, over a period of centuries, gathered them together and wove this, wor- this story. It's a nicely woven tale, to be sure. Uh, but this connection to Gilgamesh was so abundantly uh, obvious or well entrenched that it's, it continued into Islamic times, and you'll find in the Moses stories written by Muslim writers, they draw even more from the Epic of Gilgamesh mm. to flesh out his supposed life. Speaking of that, do you think that that's where the Islam comes with the prohibitions on alcohol because they don't want to fund the industries that are funding Christianity? And <laughs> It would make some sense. Well, yes and no, because they um, they in the regions where this prohibition came up, it was like in, in um, the Nifty Nabataeans, uh, the eastern in, in Jordan, there was this sect that lived at Petra, and you can almost see where this prohibition comes into being, and that's before the Common Era, so it's centuries before <laughs> Islam, in fact. But they had been wine merchants. And to this day, there's an island on the coast of Turkey that is known for its wine, and they continue to sell wine. It's Muslim, but it still is a wine merchant island. <laughs> uh, so, so some of that comes from whatever was going on with the Nabataeans, and I don't know if they just decided that people were getting intoxicated intoxicated and causing trouble for the rest of society that would have certainly that would certainly mm-hmm. be one of the reasons why they they rejected it but it's funny you should ask because the greek myths themselves give us an indication of this and that would be during the first millennium bce one of the stories is from thrace uh where the king is objecting to the the implementation of the Dionysian cult, and Dionysus has him killed. (laughs) And so basically what you're telling people in that myth is, don't resist us or we'll kill you. You will uh, take in our product. You will allow us to grow grapes in your region. You will allow us to make wine, or you will be killed. (laughs) And there there are several of these uh, cautionary tales in the Dionysian myth. An offer you can't refuse. It's <laughs> ripping Pentheus, you know, limb to limb, tearing him apart, horribly murdering the enemies. Um, yeah, and there's this, there's a myth where uh, the first vintner is accused of poisoning the people, and he's murdered. And so when the people are drinking the wine for the first time, they're like, wow, we're dying, we're being poisoned. Uh, but sooner or later, they turned that around and said, well, this is actually a medicine, and it, may, it takes your, your worries away and your suffering, and it gladdens men's minds. And so that's how they sold it. And then, of course, that's a good way also to get – you get people drunk, you get them into your cult. That's, <laughs> they're like, woo, this is fun. <laughs> right. It's a free sample first, like a drug dealer. It's 7.45. You're listening to www.riverwestradio.com. It's time for a segment we like to call Myth or Money. We have a question that Sean is going to read, or Brian is going to read, and uh, the caller with the right answer, or texter, or tweeter, or emailer with the right answer will be chosen at random, uh, and you take it away. By tomorrow at midnight, and you can get $20. We like to say that the money is real, even if the myth isn't. We want to (laughs) know the name of DM Murdoch's publishing house, so you need to um, get that to us if you want to be entered, and uh, 20 will be on your way, which you could use to buy her um, book, um, 
That would be an excellent, uh, excellent um, choice. Did Mosix exist? Would that? Would twenty dollars cover that? Well, not quite, but you could get it on Kindle for that. <laughs> you you could buy the line. You could buy the ebook. Yes. You can buy the ebook for twenty bucks. It's a deal. It's a big it. fat book and it has 125 illustrations in it. Nice, nice. 1,800 citations. It's uh, you know in multiple languages. I think I used 20 different languages in that book. I think I laid it out pretty well though. So I tried to make it so that people would actually learn the language as they're reading. So that I would include, I included it because of course I'm constantly dunned for primary sources. And I said, well, you want primary sources? Here they are. Bam. <laughs> yes, right, Aramaic or whatever. Nice. I also have an additional, I had to make an addition to that book. So I have a study guide that's full of primary sources that I couldn't include in there because otherwise it would have been a thousand pages long. We have to ask you, it's probably a sore subject by now, we have to ask you about Zeitgeist. As you probably know, without it, uh, the Mythicist Milwaukee team wouldn't exist. It really, for better or worse, inspired uh, the guys to begin their journey. And uh, I have to say that it fascinated me, too, the beginning of it. And I'm not the kind of guy who spent a lot of time looking into the various complaints about it. But uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the double-edged sword that that's been for you? Is it Why, why is it... Uh, affected you uh, negatively well i think it's all good because it summarized the mythicist perspective drawing from this massive body of jesus mythicist literature not the biased shallow junk that other people are putting out today but i'm talking about this deep well that dates back centuries it summarized that beautifully in this short easily transmitted film that reached the minds of hundreds of millions of people worldwide in multiple languages, and it had never been done before. Not this many people in all of human history have had this. We've never had this many people in human history. However, <laughs> this sig significant percentage of people have not had this, these ideas at least circulating in their minds, whether or not they kept them or agreed with them or tossed them out, I don't know. But it had never gotten to this large percentage of human beings in history and that to me is positive no negatives there okay. uh, some of the, yes thank you some of the details of it can be argued against uh, but the the debunkers are full of baloney because they have not refuted the whole thing thoroughly or debunked it or that's that's all nonsense i have proved through thousands of pages of literature since that time and even in uh, prior to that time because it had drawn from some of my work where these elements can be found in the primary sources in their original languages i have uh, you know thoroughly documented the claims in there there are a few that are not mine that i wouldn't have made in that way mm -hmm. but uh, i still was able to document them sufficiently so that as a summary that appeals to the masses it is as it is sufficiently accurate and important for that quick transmission that shocking you know it's like a it's like a uh, splash of cold water just wake up here's the data if we want to look at it more closely that's great here's the the backup documentation for it um, the people who are refuting it are glancing at encyclopedia entries that have been <laughs> sanitized for hundreds of years by vested interests, many of whom were educated at biased institutions that were founded as Christian seminaries. And so you can't become an expert on hundreds of years of literature and scholarship on a subject just by looking at Wikipedia or a, a Christian apologist website. Mm -hmm. And what I find really, really, I don't want to say the word disgusting, but I'm going to. <laughs> what I find totally disgusting. Abhorrent? It, we can throw in that. Abhorrent and appalling is how skeptics like um, atheists and agnostics and non-believers, free thinkers and so forth, that they go right along with these Christian apologist websites. That's where they're drawing their data from when they claim to be debunking zeitgeist. And it's absolutely ludicrous to do that. Why would you go to all of a sudden Christian apologists now have the right data? 
um, it's like when Christian apologists come and they throw some skeptic or atheist in my face, and they go, well, so-and-so says this and that. And I go, well, okay, so do you agree then with so-and-so that God doesn't exist? Why are you holding up an mm-hmm. atheist uh, an atheist writer as some kind of all-knowing expert. Just because you're an atheist does not mean you're omniscient. And apparently the Christians who are... Yeah, I know, right? You, the, the, parent, the Christians are holding up these atheist skeptics as all-knowing. I'm like, well, this is a very strange set of bedfellows, if you ask me. Hmm. And I like to joke that I've managed to unite the theists and atheists against me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there, there certainly is a bias. It, 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 it's it's hard even for tenured professors to to look into this. I, I think religion itself is a large institution seeking to maintain itself, and therefore there is certain bias on anyone that wants to take a hard, skeptical look into the truth claims. Yes, uh, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton—all of these were founded as Christian institutions. Mm-hmm. And in some of my books, especially in Christ in Egypt, I dug up some information concerning ancient Egyptian rituals, for example, uh, that was so buried and so hidden, I could only find it in Greek, and it had been expurgated or removed from a number of the Greek editions. I was able to find one that had been preserved in Germany, but the editions, let's say, uh, I think it was Epiphanius, of uh, one of these, of the early church fathers, as one example, had been removed from the edition that was printed and circulated within hmm. English universities. Uh, so I dug up that ancient passage, which, if I'm not confounding it with something else, because there were several of these, but it, it, this particular one I'm thinking of discussed the uh, bringing forth of the newborn baby at the winter solstice by the Egyptians. And that was so toxic to Christian claims that it had to be actually physically removed from the ancient Greek edition. To cover up the blemish, so to speak, to put some makeup over the zit. (laughs) So that people wouldn't know that this was an ancient Egyptian ritual that had been Christianized and presented (laughs) as history. We're about out of time. I want to ask you, though, you uh, said you joked that you united atheists and theists. As uh, mythicists, of course, uh, we, we aren't necessarily atheists, but we do typically see an atheist perspective on this show. Where do you fall on that uh, spectrum? Uh, is there room for spirituality in the atheist world? Well, that's a good point. I've talked to other mythicists about this, that you don't have to be an atheist to have a fascination for Religion, which is it's kind of funny how atheists are being presented as experts on religion when they really are trying to reject it and ban it. A lot of them say that. <laughs> uh, in, in our case, I, I don't care what people do within the privacy of their own minds. It's totally up to them. We have one interest, and that is what does this stuff mean? Where does it come from? These we, Now that we've acknowledged these things are myths, what is their meaning and what do they hold? What does this knowledge hold for humanity? And in fact, it has a very uniting effect on people because in this regard, you don't have to be a theist or atheist. We don't care about that. We just have this, we want to know what is the shared common cultural heritage that has led us to this point. You don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't say, oh, it's all crap and it has no meaning. Right, right. It has exquisite meaning. The, 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 the Egyptian culture is one example alone. All of that, the magnificent um, civilization that was built up over thousands of years was significantly inspired by this ancient religion uh, that had to do with nature worship, which we, we call, when it's around the celestial bodies, we call it astral religion or astro theology. I'm going to have to let that be the uh, last word, DM. I'm sorry, we're getting yeah. rushed out of the uh, okay. the uh, studio here at 7.55. You've been listening to the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. And uh, DM Murdoch, thanks for joining us. We will talk to you again soon. You know, we never talked about the winter solstice. I know it. I know it. Well, we mentioned it. <laughs> we mentioned it. We're going to hit you again. We have uh, two other podcasts. Would you be uh, uh, willing to join us again? Oh, sure. Okay, thanks. We'll give you a call. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Join us again next week for the Mythicist Milwaukee Show.